So today I'm going to start first by introducing the thermodynamic functions. And uh, those functions, uh, I only need to introduce them once because they are fairly straightforward, although the physical meaning of those functions I hope to make uh, clear. So today's talk is about the thermodynamic functions. And um, if you look at this picture, it's just an ordinary fire that you see here. Okay, ordinary fire. This is a picture I took in Graz in Austria, but you can find this picture in many places. And back in the early 19th century, people were wondering, you know, what actually is heat? Is it a substance that, you know, you pass from one uh, material to another? Uh, or what exactly constitutes heat? And, you know, there were various theories that it was actually a fluid, a substance. And it wasn't until 1820, 1830, that people started to think a lot more about what heat actually means. And the sketch that you see over here is an apparatus which was constructed by Joule. And basically, uh, you know, you have here a flask which is inside a container with water. This is actually a steel container made with tin plate. And this is a thermometer that actually he constructed himself. Um, so remember, these are, these are the days when, um, you know, you couldn't just go and buy a thermometer. But if you look at his original paper, he was able to calibrate this so accurately that he could measure one hundredth of a degree, okay? And he calibrated this against another thermometer, which was calibrated to the boiling point of water and the freezing point of pure water. And his goal was that, look, um, this is a mechanical device which pumps air into this chamber, okay? So he could, he could calculate the amount of work done in pumping the chamber, uh, pumping this chamber, and then work out how much heat is absorbed by the act of compression, um, and therefore see whether the two equate, all right? So is the mechanical energy that he put in equal to the energy, which is the heat capacity times the uh, temperature rise in that material? And lo and behold, after taking account of uh, any errors, he could derive a mechanical equivalent of heat. That means, you know, if I lift a weight by one kilogram, what is that equivalent to in terms of heat? So this was the first ever proof that energy is not uh, a fluid of some sort, which is passed on from one material to another, but it actually is a quantity which you can convert to mechanical energy and vice versa. So he discovered the mechanical equivalent of heat. And if you look at his original paper, which was in uh, 1845, it reads very beautifully. Uh, and um, you know the amount of thought that went into designing this and other critical experiments in that paper uh, is amazing. Now, how can you explain this? You know, how can you explain that you're converting mechanical energy into, uh, into something that is um, locked inside your gas in the material, in the flask? Well, you know, the argument was uh, fairly straightforward that we should think about heat as the vibration of particles. And those particles vibrate more when the temperature increases. And then it becomes clear how you could actually, by applying a mechanical force and uh, compressing the gas, cause them to move more violently and therefore you have heat. So he not only had a mechanical equivalent of heat, but he could explain the mechanism by which you heat up the gas inside the flask here by compressing this. And it isn't surprising, therefore, that Joule was the person who coined the phrase thermodynamic, because dynamic refers to these vibrations of all these atoms, which constitute uh, temperature or heat of the material, and thermo, you know, for obvious reasons. So 
I believe that this is the first paper, 1858, which actually refers to the term thermodynamic. Okay, that's what uh, our, our course is about. So there were some really amazing discoveries made in those early days where you're trying to explain what heat actually is, because if you go back a long way, you know, the four elements used to consist of uh, earth, water, fire, and air. So it was a very ethereal subject with no particular proof of what's happening. So Jules made an enormous contribution to the understanding of heat. Okay, so um, he also laid the foundations of the conservation of energy, the principle of the conservation of energy, because he found that the amount of work done mechanically was equal to the amount of heat generated inside that flask. Okay. So the principle of conservation of energy has never been violated. Okay, now let, let's uh, think about uh, some functions that we need to define in order to work with thermodynamics. Well, the first is internal energy, which we'll use the symbol U. And imagine that we have here a system and it is at a particular temperature, T2, let's say, and you transfer some heat into that material. And by sign convention, when we transfer heat into the material, we call that positive. As a consequence of that, and we are maintaining the temperature constant, as a consequence of this transfer of heat into this region, the material expands and it does work against the environment. And that work, because it's done against a, a particular pressure P, uh, we label as negative. So the change in the internal energy of our sample is the amount of heat we put in minus the amount of work done. And then you express this in, uh, express this in differential form that du is equal to dq minus dw, where dw is the work done against the pressure surrounding this object. So that is the definition of internal energy. Okay, um, if we look now at heat capacity, and I mentioned heat capacity uh, in the context of uh, Joule's experiments, but let's define it formally. So heat capacity is the heat that is absorbed per unit change in temperature. So since dq is the amount of heat that we transferred into this material uh, and the temperature change was dt, heat capacity is simply dq by dt. And since du is equal to dq plus pdv, we can write that dq is equal to du, the change in the internal energy plus this term here, which is the work done against um, the environment. So at constant volume, we define the heat capacity as du by dt, keeping the volume constant. Okay? So that's the meaning of heat capacity. Now, how do we measure heat capacity? Because it's really a very important parameter. It helps uh, us to calculate thermodynamic properties. Uh, you'll see that later we can derive terms like entropy and free energies by measuring heat capacities. Well, a very, very uh, simple way of uh, measuring the heat ca capacity is uh, using a calorimeter of some sort. Uh, this particular calorimeter it could be a differential thermal analyzer or a differential scanning calorimeter. They both work on the same principle. So what we have is two identical cans here, two identical cans, one of which contains a sample and the other one might be kept empty or it may contain an inert sample which doesn't react at all. And we enclose this into a, in a furnace here. This is a furnace. And you, know, you try and maintain the temperature inside this object extremely accurately. And we have inert gas to protect the samples. You then ramp up the temperature uh, at a certain rate. And because the sample has a certain heat capacity, whereas the 
reference here is an empty can, they will reach different temperatures, okay? So the sample may be at a higher temperature if it is able to absorb more heat uh, per unit change in the furnace temperature than the reference or the other way around. So by looking at the temperature difference between the reference and the sample, you can work out the heat capacity. Uh, if the sample undergoes a reaction, okay, uh, then you can also measure the enthalpy change accompanying that reaction, but we haven't defined enthalpy yet. So equipment like this is now quite routine and can be used to measure these thermodynamic properties such as the heat capacity. Now, normally we are not working at constant volume. You know, if we are looking at a lump of iron and we heat it up, then it's likely that it will expand. In other words, you're not measuring a property at constant volume. Uh, so instead of internal energy, we define a separate quantity, which is known as the enthalpy. So the enthalpy is the internal energy and the pl uh, plus the product of the pressure and the volume of the system. And that gives us another definition for heat capacity, which is the change in enthalpy per unit temperature at a constant pressure. So this is the more common heat capacity that we use in, in most applications. Now, supposing that you heat a sample between a temperature T1 and T2, then you can actually measure uh, the change in enthalpy as a consequence, simply by integrating the heat capacity uh, versus the temperature. So, we, we get direct information on the enthalpy changes inside a material using that calorimeter device that I showed you earlier. Okay, um, given that CP is the heat capacity at constant pressure and CV is the heat capacity at constant volume, uh, it is quite reasonable that the difference between these two depends on the bulk modulus of the material. So if your material is very stiff, then it's not going to expand much against the pressure uh, change, pressure uh, of the environment. And similarly, there will be a term in there which depends on the thermal expansion coefficient. So I don't want to go into the detail of uh, this um, actual relationship, but the difference for solids between CP and CV is really quite small. So here, for example, uh, these are uh, data for copper and tungsten, which are often used as references. Uh, and of course, the heat capacities are a function of temperature. So here I'm giving you the data for 300 Kelvin. And you can see that it's not much of a difference between the heat capacity at constant pressure and the heat capacity at constant volume. This is, of course, not the case if you're working with uh, something like a gas. Okay, now we ask a more fundamental question. Uh, consider uh, any reaction, you know, A plus B going to C. Uh, is it the case that when the enthalpy is reduced in this reaction, that means energy is liberated, uh, so the enthalpy of C is less than that combined enthalpies of A and B, is it the case that that would define whether or not this reaction happens spontaneously or not? Okay, so can we say that if the heat of reaction uh, is negative, that means you release heat, then the reaction should go forward. How do we decide whether this reaction actually occurs? And it was uh, Clausius, uh, it was um, Carnot um, many, many years ago who started to address this question. And he noted, for example, that even when there is no enthalpy change, uh, reactions can happen. Okay, so there's something, something missing. And he defined that uh, as entropy. This is the Greek root of entropy, which means to give a direction. Exactly the question I was asking earlier, that will this reaction happen? And how can I define a quantity which says this reaction will happen spontaneously in this direction? And this is another piece of 
classical work, which was done in 1824, uh, basically heat and engines. Okay, the, the huge article is about heat and engines. And what he did was absolutely brilliant. You know, he imagined uh, in his mind because at that time, you know, people were making uh, engines, steam engines, and a uh, basic question is, you know, what is the efficiency that you can get out of a steam engine? So he did a virtual experiment in his mind, and I'm going to explain, explain that to you. Okay, so imagine uh, that we have here a system which is at a temperature T2, and we put heat Q2 into that object, okay? Now, when I maintain the color as identical, I mean they are at the same temperature, okay? So all the reds are at the same temperature and all the blues are at the same temperature. So as I explained before, when we add uh, heat to this, transfer a quantity of heat into this sample here, it will, uh, it will expand in order to maintain the temperature because we've added heat and we want to maintain the temperature. So isothermally, it expands, okay? and it does a certain amount of work. Now, that is isothermal expansion, okay? If we had done this adiabatically, that means if I now completely insulate this and I adiabatically expand it, then its temperature would drop to another temperature T1 and another quantity of work is done, W2. So there's nothing complicated here. Here we are adding heat isothermally, so it's natural that this should expand. And here we are doing an adiabatic expansion, so the temperature has dropped to T1. There's no heat being added or removed. Now I want to get back to this original state. So first I do an isothermal compression of this, and that lets out a heat Q1, because we are maintaining the temperature constant. If I compress this, then clearly I've introduced energy here, and I get rid of that energy to maintain the temperature T1. And then adiabatically compress it so that I recover my original system, okay? So the temperature is increased in this adiabatic compression to T2. And this is a, what we call a reversible cycle where you've gone exactly to the original point and we haven't lost anything in terms of say friction or irreversible processes. Now the total work done uh, uh, by, the, by the object is minus W. You remember our sign convention that if you're doing work, uh, then it's a minus, and if work is being done on the object, then that's uh, a plus W. So minus uh, W is equal to the heat that we put in. And remember that the heat that we take out has a minus sign in front of it. So the work done is the difference between these two quantities. And therefore we can define the efficiency as the work done by the heat put in. We're not concerned with this because this is the actual energy that we put into our fluid. So minus W over Q2 defines the efficiency of this cycle. And of course, minus W is Q2 plus Q1 over Q2. Now this is a really, really important um, equation. It's the thermodynamic efficiency of this Carnot cycle. And what Kelvin did was he defined temperature using this equation. So he basically uh, said, okay, uh, we cannot have an efficiency greater than one. And therefore he defined an absolute temperature of zero at which the efficiency would be exactly one. So uh, T2 minus T1, if T1, the lowest part of the cycle is zero Kelvin, then the efficiency is exactly one, okay? Uh, so that is why we talk about an absolute zero, that in the Carnot cycle, you cannot get 
an efficiency greater than one. That means all the energy that is put into the material is converted into work. So the absolute zero temperature is defined in terms of the Carnot cycle. When T1 is equal to zero, we have a thermodynamic efficiency of one. And this is the, um, this equation here basically is the maximum efficiency that you can get in a cycle like this. If you have any irreversible processes happening, uh, such as, for example, friction that I mentioned or noise being generated, which is dissipated, then the efficiency will be less than this, okay? So when we talk about making aircraft engines more efficient by increasing the highest operating temperature, uh, we are not going to get anywhere near the thermodynamic efficiency simply because uh, there are other dissipative processes happening, which, uh, which means that we cannot achieve the maximum efficiency. Sorry, I, I need to let people in. Who are late. This is one of the dangers of this method of lecturing. <laughs> Harry, I am just making an announcement mm. uh, for smooth conducting of our lecture series. Do not admit anybody from uh, you know next class onward after five minutes. Okay, I think that's a good okay. idea. That's yeah. a very good idea. Okay, so I'm going to shut down the admission system. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, so. Uh, this equation is extremely powerful, and it is the guiding principle for making uh, better steam, uh, steam to electricity generators in power plant, better efficiency in uh, uh, air, uh, aircraft engines, and also uh, a measure of how much energy we are wasting that we are not recovering at as work. Now, if I take this equation here and I rearrange it, uh, so you, you can try this for yourself, uh, rearrange this equation, then you get Q2 over T2 plus Q1 over T1 equals zero. And in differential form, that would be DQ2 by T2 plus DQ1 by T1 equals zero. And since we have recovered our original state by going through this cycle, uh, basically the integral of dq by t over that cycle is zero for a reversible process. And this, of course, is entropy. This is the entropy that Carnot defined, the Carnot entropy, okay? Now, this is for a reversible process where dq over t across that cycle becomes zero. If we have an irreversible process, for example, uh, here, then uh, what I'm doing here is I have a body at a temperature T2 and another body at a temperature, a lower temperature T1. And they are connected here by uh, something that allows the heat to flow through, for example, copper. So the heat is flowing in this direction into this container. This process is irreversible because we are actually uh, dissipating energy from T2 to T1. And in such a process, the entropy change, uh, according to that Carnot entropy that we derived earlier, is Q over T1 minus Q over T2. This is the um, final minus the initial, and that's the change. And that clearly has to be greater than zero because T2 is greater than T1. So this is a smaller quantity. So in any irreversible process, so this is the second really important conclusion, in any irreversible process, the change in entropy will be greater than zero. Okay, so um, entropy is a difficult concept to grasp, uh, but in terms of the Carnot cycle, it's straightforward we managed to define the thermodynamic efficiency and uh, also the fact that if you have an irreversible process, you will get an increase in entropy. But what does this diagram actually show? 
what is showing is that we had organized energy. We had a sample which is hot and a sample which is cold. By allowing the transfer of heat, you are basically spreading out the energy. Okay? So that is a greater dis degree of disorder than having organized heat. You know, when you have an electrical battery in your phone, that is organized energy. And of course, when you use your phone, you are dissipating that energy and spreading it out. And therefore the entropy is increasing all the time. So entropy does really correspond to disorder being created. And I will show you now another example of this, uh, which, you know, sometimes it's difficult to link the entropy description that I'm going to give you in the next slide with the entropy description of Carnot, but you'll see that they are actually um, both dealing with an increase in disorder. So imagine that we have a crystal here and the crystal has red atoms on this side and black atoms on this side. And there are N atoms of type A, let's say red, and N minus N of type B where capital N is the total number of atoms, okay? So this is just saying that we have N minus the red of B atoms. So this is highly organized. We have all the red atoms on one side and all the black atoms on the other side. But supposing we allow them to mix in some way, okay? So I've just given you three different arrangements that I can make without changing the composition or the size of the crystal. These are simply three different arrangements. So the probability of getting a, a disorganized array of atoms is much greater than of getting an organized array of atoms, okay? And we can work that out. So if I were to place uh, the first atom onto this lattice, okay? So imagine that all these sites are unoccupied and I place one atom, I can place it at capital N different locations, okay? And the second atom will only have access to capital N minus one uh, locations. And, you know, we've got to make a correction for that second atom because uh, we, you know, there are two, two ways in which you can place it on, on that lattice. So we divide by a factor of two. And if I continue this process, then uh, I have um, this equation telling me the total number of arrangements. Now, I don't think I explained this very well. Uh, you know, if I chose this atom first, then the second atom would be placed at another location. And if I chose one atom uh, of that pair first, then I would have another possibility and we can't distinguish those possibilities. So we divide by two. And similarly, as we continue this process, uh, you, you end up with an equation like this where we have this uh, factorial, uh, capital N factorial over small n factorial times capital N minus small n factorial. So that gives us the total number of arrangements that we can have in this system of atoms. And Boltzmann was uh, working on this and it was at a time when uh, people were not absolutely certain whether matter was uh, particulate, that means consisting of atoms. And there, there were really huge arguments about this and they were often not very pleasant. But before he did that, he came up with this equation. So these are the number of arrangements, the number of configurations of these atoms. And he wrote entropy as being proportional to log of the number of configurations. Now, the reason for choosing a log is that entropy is an additive property. That means if I take two bodies with two different entropies, put them together, then the total is the sum of the two. And therefore, uh, you know, if I take the log of the number of configurations, I can add up the terms to get the total entropy. 
at k, which is what we call the Boltzmann uh, constant, is uh, simply the proportionality constant between this and log of that. And if I substitute that equation telling me the number of configurations here into the Boltzmann equation, I end up with something like this, where the change in entropy when you mix, uh, mix the atoms is the concentration of a particular species times the log of the concentration of that particular species times R, which is the Boltzmann constant times Avogadro's number is the gas constant. Now I'm going to show you how to derive this. And in order to do this, I need to change the screen that I'm sharing to another device. Okay, let's derive the logarithm of the number of configurations. Using Stirling's approximation that y log y minus y is equal to log of y factorial. So this uh, term here becomes n log n minus n. And this is underneath, so it will be minus small n log small n plus small n. And similarly, minus capital N minus small n log n minus n plus n minus n. Now we can uh, get rid of these terms. So our equation becomes n log n minus n log n Now I'm going to rewrite this term here as n minus n plus n. So I will bring together all the terms, uh, therefore, And if I divide uh, by Avogadro's number, I get minus x log x minus one minus x log one minus x, which is exactly the equation that we were trying to derive. And that is a representation of configurational entropy. And again, it represents a degree of disorder because we started with a highly organized crystal where all the black atoms were on one side and all the red atoms were on the other side. And then we looked at all other possibilities and that gives us the change in entropy when you go from a highly organized system where there is only one arrangement possible to uh, many, many possibilities.
you can imagine that if you have you know 10 to the power of 23 atoms in the system, then the number of arrangements is very, very large. Okay, so that, that was uh, basically a substitution of this into Sterling's approximation to derive this. Now, in that particular example uh, of the disordering of uh, the crystal, uh, let's assume that there is no difference in the binding energies uh, when we change from AA bonds to BB bonds, right? In other words, that this is an ideal solution that we form. Then what would drive that disordering process? Well, you know, the enthalpy change is zero. If we, if we say that there is no change in bond energy when we mix up the atoms, but the reaction never ha nevertheless happens when we mix the A and B atoms together and allow them to move. So the entropy change is greater than zero and therefore the reaction happens in the direction of disordering. So the enthalpy change by itself is not sufficient to decide on the direction of the reaction. So we'll bear that in mind. Uh, before I go, uh, before I do that, you know, we've got uh, this equation for the differential change in entropy being dq over t, and therefore we can work out the entropy change as we heat up the samples from t1 to t2 as simply cp over t dt. So this is a quantity that you can measure directly using calorimetry. So we need to define another function which actually tells us which direction the reaction can proceed in uh, in a spontaneous manner. And that is the Gibbs free energy here, which is the enthalpy minus the temperature times the entropy. So it is this quantity which must be reduced for a reaction to be able to occur spontaneously. Now, this is at constant pressure. If we weren't working at constant pressure, but at constant volume, then this would be replaced by the Helmholtz free energy, which has a symbol F, and this would be the internal energy U. So you can see that the heat capacity is an extremely important parameter. Uh, from an experimental point of view, you can do measurements. You can even measure the enthalpy change on that um, uh, calorimeter that I described to you earlier. And you know, we routinely now use phase diagram calculations but all those calculations depend on thermodynamic data, which at some stage were measured. Yeah. Now, what is the mechanism by which a material absorbs heat? So you can factorize, uh, for metals, you can factorize the heat capacity into three essential terms. One is due to the lattice vibrations. Uh, the vibrations become more energetic as the temperature is increased. Uh, and that is a mechanism of absorbing heat. Uh, secondly, we have an electronic contribution because you know, in metals, uh, the electrons, some of the electrons are not bound to individual atoms. They are able to move like an electron gas and therefore there's an ability to absorb energy. And a magnetic term. So if you have magnetic ordering and as you raise the temperature, the magnetic spins tend to become disordered, then that is also a mechanism for absorbing energy. Now, I will repeat this many times in this series of lectures, but in the case of iron, body-centered cubic iron, if we did not have this term here, paramagnetic to paramagnetic uh, disordering as we go beyond the Curie temperature, then we would not have body-centered cubic ions stable at ambient temperature and pressure. Okay. Now just imagine your life without body-centered cubic iron. It would be absolutely miserable. Okay, So you owe magnetism for civilization uh, in your lives. Now, let me just comment on the magnitude of this and this, okay? So lattice vibrations um, follow what's known as the Boltzmann distribution. So supposing you take a cylinder and you fill it up with ping pong balls, all right? 
uh, and they're all at rest and then you pump gas from underneath, then all the balls will not rise to the same energy level, okay? There will be a distribution of heights to which the balls jump. Uh, and that is a distribution which we call the Boltzmann distribution. And there is no limitation on how many balls can occupy a particular energy state. That is not the case for electrons. You know, uh, for each energy band, you can only have two electrons with opposite spins occupying that energy state. And that's illustrated here. So this is uh, the Boltzmann distribution that I talked about earlier. There's really no limit on how many particles can occupy a particular energy level. But in the case of electrons, only two can occupy any particular uh, energy state. So it is only the electrons that are close to what's known as the Fermi energy. Uh, so at zero Kelvin, you know, these are all the occupied states and the maximum energy which is occupied at zero Kelvin is called the Fermi energy. As we raise the temperature, only those electrons in the vicinity of the Fermi energy can actually jump to higher energy levels. So it's a very small fraction that can participate in the process of absorbing heat. And this Fermi temperature, for example, for iron is something like 14,000 Kelvin, all right? So uh, at, at that temperature, you know, you would have all the electrons participating in the absorption of energy, but we are not going to get to 14,000 Kelvin. So in general, you know, there's very little heat capacity from the electronic term. The lattice vibrations, the heat capacity follows a curve like this. Uh, now, this is what you might expect from a gas, uh, from a monoatomic gas, which has um, different vibration modes, okay? Three different vibration modes. And therefore the uh, heat capacity is three times N times K, three degrees of freedom of vibration. Uh, and it's at the divide temperature, TD, that a metal would begin to behave as if all the atoms are vibrating independently, all right? They're not uh, constrained uh, in a sense by the lattice. But you know, uh, at lower temperatures, uh, one atom vibrating this way will obviously have an interference from other atoms around it. So they tend to be a little bit more collective and therefore the heat capacity decreases as you go down in temperature. Now for iron, the divide temperature is of the order of 400 degrees. Uh, centigrade. Okay, um, so this illustrates the point I was making earlier. Uh, the dashed curve here represents the heat capacity uh, due to lattice vibrations and the electronic term for alpha ion, the body-centered cubic form of ion. And this curve here is all three terms, the magnetic, electronic, and lattice vibrations. And you can see there's a very large contribution from the magnetic term in the case of uh, body-centered cubic iron. But the same applies actually for austenite, that there is a magnetic contribution to the heat capacity, which is quite significant. So heat capacity is a really important parameter that we can measure directly and use in calculations. These data actually are from Kaufman, Clothe, and Weiss from uh, the early 1950s, where they showed, uh, you know, BCC iron at ambient conditions, then FCC iron, and then reverting back to BCC iron, which is very strange behavior. And that is entirely due to the magnetic properties of iron. So this is what I want to teach you today, but uh, learning thermodynamics can be a bit abstract. So I'm going to show you now how you can immediately apply the knowledge from today to some of the latest research that's uh, going on in the world. So the first example I'm giving you is the so-called high entropy alloys, okay? So this was an idea uh, originating, I think, from Brian Cantor uh, 
where he wanted to work on alloys which contain equal concentrations of all the solutes or all the elements. So there is no solvent and there is no solute. All of the elements inside your alloy are at equal concentrations. And if you do that, then you get a maximum configurational entropy. Assuming that all the atoms are mixed at random, uh, you get a maximum configurational entropy. And there is a, a sense of confusion inside the alloy, which kind of stabilizes a single phase, even though we have uh, a combination of uh, 20 atomic percent of cobalt, manganese, iron, chromium, and nickel, you end up with a single phase alloy. And the reason why they're called high entropy is because if all the solutes are in, all the elements are in exactly the same concentration, then the entropy of mixing is at a maximum, okay? So uh, it's very interesting. This is the single phase. Uh, in this uh, complex alloy, which, is, uh, which has five different elements. And even though the crystal structures uh, are, are different, so it's only nickel which has the FCC structure at ambient temperature. Uh, this is cobalt is hexagonal close packed. Manganese uh, has a unit cell with 58 atoms in it. And we have body centered cubic iron and body centered cubic chromium. Even though um, the crystal structures are so different, when you mix them in equal quantities, you end up with a face-centered cubic structure, exactly like nickel. Now that is good, as we know, you know, uh, there are many, many slip systems and so forth, so the material should have good properties. And this is just to show you that, you know, if I hadn't told you this was a high entropy alloy, you might say it's copper or, or just pure nickel. But the properties are very good, you know, with uh, a strength of one gigapascal, a uh, fracture toughness of 200 megapascal root meters, and an elongation of 70%. What is the next stage required in the development of this subject? So my opinion, uh, first, first of all, I should say that, uh, you know, uh, this, this has been a story that it's a high entropy alloy. But in fact, this equation only applies to an ideal solution where there's no change in enthalpy when you mix the solutes and that absolutely is not the case here. So you will not get a random distribution of these atoms inside our alloy. You will in fact get uh, clustering or, or other phenomena. So if you forget about the fact that it's high entropy, but just focus on, um, focus on the fact that we have equal concentrations of everything, and we've obtained a single phase, what is to stop us from exploiting these properties? And that I think is where the subject is stuck and where much more research is needed, is how do you scale up an alloy like this, okay? So that when you actually make it uh, solidify, you don't get segregation and many other complications which lead to precipitation. And what application do I need this where I have such an expensive alloy, okay? So right now, I would argue that there isn't a single application of high entropy alloys. The science has essentially been done, okay? You can always, uh, you know, dot the I's and cross the T's, but if you want to be serious about this, you need to be able to scale it up and to find an application which genuinely needs an alloy with this level of expense. Now, the second example I'm going to give you, and we are only using the information we've learned today. Okay, so just after one lecture on thermodynamics. So supposing that uh, we have a defect, for example, a vacancy inside of a lattice, then obviously the way in which we can make uh, we can arrange the atoms onto this lattice increases dramatically because the vacancy can be located at any, any of those sites. And let's say that the energy required to create that vacancy is uh, for one vacancy is delta G, small g, and N is the number of such defects. This is a cost. And 
the cost of creating a defect means that it doesn't really want to form. However, this term here actually favors the formation of that vacancy. This is the configurational entropy, which favors disorder. That means more vacancies we put in there uh, up, to, up to a limit, the more configurations we will have, and therefore you favor the formation of the vacancy. So these two terms here oppose each other. So to find, uh, find the equilibrium value, you differentiate this with respect to the number of defects, set it to zero, and you get that the equilibrium number of defects is small n divided by the total number of sites I have here uh, into the exponential of the energy of formation of a single defect divided by kT. So what this shows is that you will always have defects at equilibrium, right? There is no way you can create a defect-free material uh, if you are at equilibrium. And this, of course, is the reason why you get diffusion in the solid state, right? Because it's the jumping of atoms into these vacancies which gives us the transport of atoms. But much more importantly, if we look at some work done back in 1956 on the strength of iron, single crystals of iron, then you can see that we can achieve strengths of the order of 15 gigapascals, right? by looking at single crystals of absolutely pure iron. But the strength collapses as the size increases. Okay, So this equation gives you a clue. N is the to effectively a size here, the number of entities. As we increase the number of entities, so will the number of defects increase. And therefore, the strength collapses to what we normally get for iron. So if you try to get strength by making something perfect, and you know you can get a perfect crystal if you make it small enough, in which case you have to rip the atoms apart and that's why it's so strong. But as you increase the size, the probability of finding a defect also increases and therefore the strength collapses. And this is a lesson that was learned in 1956. And we could have saved literally hundreds of millions of pounds if people had studied this paper and some elementary thermodynamics because there was a lot of noise made when carbon nanotubes came about and the strength of carbon nanotubes was said to be 130 gigapascals, which is basically the carbon-carbon bond strength. And a huge amount of money was wasted in trying to make carbon nanotubes as structural materials. But of course, there is a strength of 130 gigapascals when the tube is very, very small, but its strength collapses as you increase the size for exactly the same reason that very fundamental uh, configurational entropy equation that we derived. Precisely the same applies to graphene. As soon as you scale up the size of graphene, its strength is lost. So it's complete nonsense to talk about these materials as structural materials on the size scales that we are normally used to. So thermodynamics is a very powerful tool with which you can actually influence your research and thinking and interpret news items. You know, because these stories made enormous uh, on, on the graphene and the nanotubes made enormous news stories with ridiculous statements about how it is 200 times stronger than steel, whereas an elementary thermodynamics equation would have told you that this is not actually a reasonable thing to say. Right now, in the next lecture, having defined all these uh, quantities, I will deal with equilibrium. That means, you know, if I put two different compositions or two different lattices and compositions together, how can we decide whether that will change, that, that initial uh, configuration will change or not, no matter how long I observe it. So in the case of an allotropic transition in a pure substance, uh, we, can, we can plot the free energy, the Gibbs free energy as a function of temperature and 
where they intersect, they have equal free energy. So there's no tendency whatsoever to change from one to the other. And that clearly defines an equilibrium temperature. But we very, very rarely deal with pure substances. So we need to think a little bit more about the nature of a solid solution in a multi-component system. Okay, I'll end, uh, end the talk now.